Let us pray. Our understanding of your word comes from you, O God. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Help us upon hearing to understand and upon understanding to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible version. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work, and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Gentiles long for all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God does some of God's best work in the dark. That was the conclusion from last week's sermon, which was the first installment of this month's series on treasures of darkness. Darkness is shorthand for anything that scares me, writes Barbara Brown Taylor, whose latest book inspired this series. It scares me because I'm sure I don't have the resources to survive it or because I don't want to find out. Almost everyone is afraid of being afraid. But the story of God's interaction with God's people throughout the Bible points to a God who speaks through dreams and visions in the dead of night. A God who speaks from the top of mountains shrouded in clouds. God does some of God's best work in the dark. Still, the dark is a place where we don't want to be or to go, outwardly or inwardly. Taylor writes, for a measure of your comfort with the dark, notice how many lights you leave on at night. Our comfort or discomfort with the outer dark is a good barometer of how we feel about the inner kind. And because our discomfort is fairly high, we're lighting up everything everywhere as a result. If we can't have a natural supermoon every night, then we will and we are flooding our world with artificial lights. We're pushing the edge of darkness as far away as we possibly can. But there's a problem. Too much light. Call it light trespass, light clutter, light pollution. It's too much light. Las Vegas may be the city where what happens there stays there, but that city's lights are visible from eight different national parks and the major cause of light pollution in Death Valley National Park, which is 93 miles away. There are at least 2,500 stars that are visible in a nice, clear night sky. But in the heart of a city, that number often drops to fewer than 12. Artificial light at night is a very serious issue. We not only need plenty of darkness to sleep well, we also need it to be well, writes Taylor. The circadian rhythm of waking and sleeping matches the natural cycle of day and night, which affects everything from our body chemistry to our relationships. When we tinker with it, we tinker with the well-being of every creature whose pupils shrink when we turn on the light. 
What then shall we make of the human determination to light the night to the point that all creation suffers from our inventiveness? Taylor tells of the experience she and her husband Ed had while spending time on one of the barrier islands off the coast of Georgia. It's an area where loggerhead turtles lay their eggs. And one day they happened to stumble upon one of those turtles and the animal was near death. And the tailors began piecing together what they think had happened. Based on its tracks, the turtle had come ashore overnight to lay its eggs. And afterwards, she'd followed that natural instinct to head toward the brightest horizon, which meant the life-renewing seawater. Problem was, the turtle was headed up into the dunes instead of back down to the sea. The brightest horizon had turned out to be the artificial lights on the mainland. And by the time the tailors found her, she was mired in sand and half cooked by the sun. So this wife and husband duo sprang into action. She covered the turtle with cool sand while he headed out to find help. We're avoiding the dark at all costs, and the costs are terribly high. And we haven't even touched upon the correlation between poverty and darkness. Taylor notes how the brightest spots on earth have never been the places where the most people live, but rather the places where the most prosperous people live, where there is money and power enough to light the dark. Darkness doesn't stand a chance. One of the folks who gathered for the Monday morning coffee chat last week noted that the church is also a place that seems to excel at keeping darkness far away. After all, who wants to talk about those feelings we associate with darkness, like anxiety and depression? Who wants to admit to pacing the floor in the middle of the night, feeling confused and wondering if God is even there? Certainly none of us. Let's keep all of that at bay. In fact, let's just keep on the sunny side, shall we? I happen to have the Sunnyside Band who has come here this morning. The, wor the words are in your bulletin, and I invite you to join along at any point you'd like, especially the refrain or the, co the chorus. All right. Can you see the words? I can't see the words.
That was great fun. I think I can just pronounce the benediction now. But you know, there's a problem with always keeping on the sunny side. Taylor puts it this way. To embrace that kind of teaching at face value can result in a kind of spirituality that deals with darkness by denying its existence or depriving it of meaningful attention. I call it solar spirituality, she says, since it focuses on staying in the light of God around the clock, both absorbing and reflecting the sunny side of faith. You can usually recognize a full solar church by its emphasis on the benefits of faith, which includes a sure sense of God's presence, divine guidance in all things, and reliable answers to all prayers. Members strive to be positive in attitude and unwavering in faith. However, trouble starts when darkness descends on your life. The first time you speak of these things in a full solar church, you can usually get a hearing. If you continue, then you may be reminded that God will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But if you still don't get the message, sooner, and later, sooner or later it will be made explicit to you that darkness is your own fault because you didn't have enough faith. In her own such experience, Taylor concludes that she exhausted the resources of those with a sunny spirituality. They couldn't enter the dark without putting their own faith at risk, so they did the best they could. They stood where I could still hear them and begged me to come back into the light. If I could, I would have. One of the surefire ways to begin to tackle our fear of the dark is to look up. Someone once wrote, a dark night sky is a passage beyond the self. It is plumbing the celestial matrix and saying, wow. Taylor says it begins for her when she wakes up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep. I don't know. I, I can't relate to that. Can you? Yeah. Before long, she's off to the races with a multitude of thoughts, most of them laden with anxiety. There's one cure for me on nights like that, she writes. If I can summon the energy to put on my bathrobe and go outside, the night sky will heal me, not by reassuring me that I will be just fine, but by reminding me of my place in the universe. Looking up at the same stars that human beings have been looking at for millennia, I find my place near the end of that long, long line of stargazers who've stood here before me. I'm convinced that one of those stargazers long ago was the psalmist. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them? Taylor continues, every atom on earth comes from the sky I'm looking at. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, iron, the basic building blocks of everything from the high peaks of the Himalayas to the hollow flutes of my bones. If I can imagine eternal life, if I can't imagine eternal life any other way, I can start with a carbon atom, since every one of them that ever existed is still around here somewhere. The lead in my pencil might as well declare that it is made in Orion as made in China, Ramo says. I and everything I love have come forth from the furnace of the stars by a process so full of unfath unfathomable life-giving grace that my earlier worry strikes me as cheap. Having summoned the energy to put on my bathrobe and go outside, I can now come back in and go to bed. The stars are in their heaven, and all is right with the world. Last week, I invited you to go outside after the sun had set and simply experience the darkness. This week, the invitation is to continue that, but I would invite you to turn off some or all of the lights in your bedroom at night, tonight. Cover up the light on your clock. 
Unplug the computer, unplug the TV, douse the nightlight. Help your body begin to get back to its natural circadian rhythm. Take note of that experience and then come for coffee tomorrow at 9.30 in room 102 and share it. Or come and talk about Taylor's book. Or come and just enjoy a cup of coffee and see where the conversation takes us. You remember that loggerhead turtle that Taylor and her husband came upon? She'd covered the turtle with cool sand and he had gone for help. Well, Taylor's husband returned with a park ranger. The ranger flipped that turtle over on its back, wrapped tire chains around its front legs and hooked the chains to his Jeep. And then he took off at full speed and raced across the dunes toward the water with that turtle bouncing along behind. At the ocean's edge, he unhooked her and the three of them turned her right side up again. And the turtle lay motionless as the water lapped up against her body, washing the sand out of her eyes, making her skin and her shell glisten again. Each fresh wave brought renewed life to her. Finally, one wave made her light enough to get a foothold and push off back into the water, back toward home. Sometimes they make it, the ranger said, and sometimes they don't. We won't know till next year. If she comes back to lay her eggs again, we'll know she survived. All of those turtles, old and young, follow their instinct and head toward the ocean. The hatchlings are subject to the same confusion as their mothers, given the ongoing development on the mainland. What hope do the turtles have with their navigational system made obsolete by humans? It's a good question, and it's a dilemma that we aren't able to solve here this morning. But here's what we can do this morning. Earlier, we promised to nurture little Jim Benton in the faith. No doubt about it, Jim is going to experience ups and downs in his life. Being human, he will find himself in the midst of one of those dark nights of the soul. The last thing he will probably want us to say is, come on, cheer up, turn that frown upside down. Instead, what he will likely need is for us to walk with him through the pain or the fear or the doubt or the sadness or whatever it is. We won't be able to fix it. But we can remind him that he's not alone and that the one who created him will not abandon him either. Not now, not then, not ever. And that goes for the rest of us too. Thanks be to God.